Hello and welcome to today's tutorial on identifying your leaks. What I'm going to take you through today is understanding your 13 touchpoint leaks. The 13 touchpoint leaks come from chapter 2 in my book Watertight Marketing and you can grab that now for free um, by getting part 1 from the watertightmarketing.com website. On the site you'll see that there's a page which says free sample chapter which will get you a free sample chapter. And if you want all of part one for free um, as a PDF, register for email updates and it will be emailed to you. So I'm, um, I'm the author, I'm Bryony Thomas, and my, uh, my background in marketing over the last um, 16 years or so has given me a real passion for making sure that every ounce of an entre entrepreneur's time money and energy that they put into to telling the world about their products and services actually pays back and it pays back in sales results and in the long term. So that's what I'm here to help you with today and if you have any questions on today's session, if when you're reading Watertight Marketing you just want to clarify something or you have a great example for me then please do drop me a line. You can find me on Twitter at Bryony Thomas. So let me tell you a little more about why I wrote Watertight Marketing and why I'm so excited that you've just taken a moment out to consider where you might be leaking some profit. Because what I've observed in so, so many small businesses, it happens in larger businesses too, but more often in smaller businesses, and that is that people get themselves on a, on a roller coaster and it's exhausting. So what it looks like is, is something like this. Your marketing activity and your sales results are kind of stuck on this yo-yo cycle. And this is often because resources are tight um, or, you know, the skills for marketing are, aren't, aren't totally dedicated. And so you win a great big piece of business. It's all hands to the pump, delivering, delivering, delivering. And whilst you're doing that the time and energy slips away from marketing. It's redirected into delivery. And that means that you've gone quiet and the leads don't come in as readily. And when your head pops up looking for that next piece of work, it's not there. So you end up kind of feast and famine. And that's really exhausting. But also, it means that you can never really get traction. You can't get your business on that upward curve and make it into the, the brilliant business that you know it could be. What Watertight Marketing does is give you the tools and the tips and the structure and the clarity to make marketing something that you do pretty steadily and in an ongoing way so that sales results build and they grow and they become sustainable and predictable. And that means that you can relax into your business and do what you're brilliant at, knowing that the sales results will come and they will come in the long term. So what Watertight Marketing is about is giving an entrepreneur a step-by-step -step guide to putting a marketing operation in place for their business that delivers sales results in the long term. Step off the roller coaster, get on an upward curve. So if that sounds attractive, then keep listening. I want to make absolutely sure that everyone on today's session is someone who's going to get value from the time spent. So let me make really, really clear who Watertight Marketing works for. The illustration that I've um, put up now is um, is what I call the buying decision continuum. Um, so if someone's uh, you know a really good copywriter out there and has a, a much nattier description of this for me, do 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 tweet me and let me know. But on the left hand side here, you have what I would call an impulse purchase. And these are typically characterized by being an amount of money that the buyer can afford to lose. You know, if it's a bad decision, hey, no big deal. Usually, the decision they make only affects one person, them. And here's the critical piece. What they are buying 
fulfills either an emotional or a functional need, but not both. Now, at the other end of the continuum here, the amount of money involved is an amount of money that that, that person would find painful to lose. The decision they make affects more than one person, usually a group of people. And what they are buying fulfills both an emotional and a functional need. And this isn't a case of business to consumer and business to business. Lots of people kind of like to say that the consumer end is the left of this and business to business is the right of this. And I don't subscribe to that. So let's just map a few consumer purchases on here. On the left hand side, you'd have, you know, a bar of chocolate. You would have um, grabbing yourself a, a pack of tissues as you're going through a, a railway station. Or it might be, you know, that handbag that screamed out at you and said, buy me now. You know, one of those I had to have it moments. Or is that just me? Up on the right hand side of consumer purchases, what you would have here is things like, you know, buying a, a child safety seat for your car. You would have um, choosing a family holiday, buying a mortgage. And I think you can, you know, readily see the differences between those sorts of purchases. In a business to business context, down at the left hand side, you might have something like restocking the stationery cupboard. Somewhere towards the middle, you're going to have, you know, choosing um, an advisor for your business. Um, and right up on the right hand side, it might be the selection and installation of a really complex piece of software for your business. Now, if what you sell, would be placed on this line somewhere in the little red circle that I've just put up, then today's call is going to be really useful for you and watertight marketing is something that impact on your business. And the, there's a key reason for this. So down on the left, the buying decision goes something like, see it, buy it. One step. <laughs> the further you go to the right, the more steps there are involved. And the really considered purchases will go something like this see it, like it, suss it out, try it out, buy it out, love it, something like that. So, you know, the steps here that I have are awareness, interest, evaluation, trial, adoption and loyalty. The mar Any marketeers listening will, will recognise Kotler stamped all over that, you know, hands up, I didn't make up this theory. But what I am going to show you is how to map your marketing against it. Now, what most people do is then they take um, a sales funnel and they map these kind of different thought processes onto the sales funnel. Because what you'll find is that there are more people at the top than, than at the bottom. Now, that's a really important point to make because people talk about sales funnels and sales pipelines. And I don't know about you, but, you know, the sales funnel, the funnels that I have in my kitchen cupboard, when I pour a load of water in the top, all of the water comes out at the bottom. And wouldn't that be just amazing if that happened to uh, your bottom line and your profit? You know, everyone who's ever heard of your business ends up giving you some money. Well, we all know that isn't the case because actually, as someone goes from one step to the next, they either rule you in or rule you out. And people are going to drop out of your sales process. People are going to drop out of their decision to buy from you. What watertight marketing does is make sure that there is a stepping stone, a tool, a technique, that every step in a buyer's decision, so that they're more likely to make the whole journey through to buying and loving what you do. Now, dropping out of a process happens all over those steps. So what I've done is I've amalgamated all my experience from the hundreds of businesses I've worked with and I've looked at all the typical ways that people are just wasting money on marketing, to be honest, because whatever they do you know, upstream isn't turning into profit because people are, be are being lost along the way. 
And I've summarized these into 30 key ways that the interaction with the customer, the touch point, is wrong and it's leaking. And I'm yet to find a, an organization who couldn't tighten up somewhere. So I'm willing to bet that you are leaking profit. Let me help you to find out where. Now, to make this easier, more practical, more helpful, um, I've designed a little assessment sheet. And you can go and grab this now um, on the Waterstone Marketing site. If you're on the site, then your, your sheet is below this video. Um, if you're not um, on the site, then head to wallstepmarketing.com, go to the library, you'll find a, a page there called Identify Your Profit Leaks, and you can download a simple two-page PDF. So I'm just going to pause for a moment, um, let you pause this video whilst you just go and hit print, and I'm hoping you're going to come back with a pen and paper in hand and, um, and your uh, touchpoint assessment sheet. Great, welcome back. I'm hoping that you now have in hand a nice piece of paper and a pen. So as I go through and describe each of the leaks, what I'm going to then do at the end is I'm going to ask you a question. And on your sheet, I want you to tick yes, no, or don't know. And then at the end, I'm going to tell you what to do about that. So here they are, the 13 touchpoint leaks. Now I'm going to ask you to take a, a, a quick look at that diagram for a moment and notice something really important and that is that it starts at the bottom and moves up. That's really important. I really want you to turn your thinking about sales funnels on its head. I want you just for the moment to stop thinking about how to pour more into the top and look instead from the bottom up. Because this way, when you come to spend time, money and energy telling the world about what you do, you will get more back. In fact, by addressing the leaks from the bottom up, you won't need to pour as much into the top to get the same or better results. So that's the first kind of you know, lesson of the day. Start at the bottom and move up. So let's go for it. Let's go through these touchpoint leaks. Number one is forgotten customers. So look first to the people who've been on your books for a while. It is really easy to think that once you've got them, the hard work is over. But unfortunately, your business just isn't the most important thing on their list. It's so easy for them to forget about you. If you've got customers who are, I don't know, paying an annual fee or something, you know, they don't hear from you very often um, by what you do. When the renewal invoice comes round, you know, they could work very well or forgotten who you are, forgotten why they chose you in the first place, and that is a potential leak. So quite apart from, you know, telling them, doing the upsell, telling them anything else about what you have on offer, just reminding them why they bought from you in the first place is really important. In the UK, there's quite a lot of talk about um, kind of changing our school year. We have a six-week summer holiday, and there's research been done that shows that that kids just forget everything they learn just before they went off on their six-week holiday because it's been too long since they were reminded, too long since they looked at that piece of work. And you know, these are fresh young minds. Imagine your customers how quickly they get on with their business, they get on with their lives, and, and just forget about why they bought from you in the first place. Now, what you've got up on screen there is what you will find in Watertight Marketing. These are um, the four things that in the book I've outlined in detail and given a worked example of how you fix this leak. So I'm just going to ask you the question, get your sheet, and I want you to answer yes, no, or don't know to the following question. Do you have a consistent customer communications program that proactively addresses any service needs and keeps your business in their minds? Is that a yes, a no, or a don't know? Okay, let's move on to leak number two. Leak number two 
is poor onboarding. So now we're moving up a bit and I want you to look now at the people who've just become a customer of yours. They're, you know, brand new on the books. Anyone who's just signed up with you is in this, it's what I call the welcome window. There's a really important moment of time and it's a, that critical period between placing an order and considering themselves a loyal customer of yours. It's that, that period of time when they're sussing out whether or not you're actually living up to the expectations that they had. Exactly how long that is will really depend on your company. For my, um, as a consultant, if I've um, been in a sales conversation with somebody and then I'm going in and I'm doing a, a kind of marketing audit, then usually I would say that people feel that they've sussed me out and they feel like they're a customer of, my, customer of mine, probably after I've completed the first workshop. You need to work out what that is for you. But what's really important is that just because they appear on your books as a customer, that doesn't mean that they think they are a customer of yours. What I outline in the book is identifying your welcome window, making sure that you have a really structured welcome pack that you know gives them that hug when they've become a customer, gives them the critical information they need to get the most from working with you and actually puts in place a really clear set of customer communications that happen during that welcome window. So here is pen at the ready please, here's the question. Do you have a structured approach to communication with new customers as they settle into their relationship with you which demonstrates that your service is consistent with the expectations they had? Is that a yes, a no, or I don't know. Moving on up. So this is at the adoption stage. This is when they're just about to sign on the dotted line. And the leak is called no emotional connection. So when someone's just about to give you some money, it's just that little emotional tug in their head that says, are you sure? Now, you know, have think of a scenario or perhaps you can imagine where you've worked really hard on a deal and then you find that it goes to someone you know another business that your buyer plays golf with or something like that you know it went to not the best solution but the people they liked best having an emotional connection with your potential buyer is really important for overcoming that little voice in their head who says are you absolutely sure just before they sign over their money. Now, what I outline as fixes is making sure that you express the kind of people you are so that people can, your buyers can really like and, and engage with you on a really human level. And there's details on how you do that with your visual identity, your tone of voice, the way you speak, and really having that personal touch. So here's the question, pen at the ready. Does your visual and written style have a personal touch that's friendly and allows people to make an emotional connection with your business? Yes, no, or don't know. Okay. Okay, we're now moving up the sales funnel and we're now moving to the point at which someone is trying out. They're just getting a sense of, um, of your products and services. Leak number four is no gateway. So your onboarding, your kind of welcome communications might be absolutely brilliant, but what about people who don't actually get that far? What you need to do is really give people a sense of what it's like to be a customer of yours before they are one. It's like you know, when you buy some new clothes, um, you have to try them on first. There is no other way of knowing whether or not they're going to suit you. You need to find a way, even if yours is a knowledge-based business or a product business, that, that people can get a tangible sense of what it's like to be your customer so that they can try before they buy effectively. And there are two key ways that um, in, in the book I kind of outline as potential fixes for this leak. The first is a product ladder where you put in a complementary set of products that lead one to the next, increasing in their commitment. 
And the second is a no commitment trial. And a no commit commitment trial is effectively some sort of window onto your business through which people can look completely unencumbered. So here goes, here's the question. Does your business offer a coherent set of products that lead helpfully from one to the next with the inclusion of a stepping stone that allows people to understand what it's like to be a customer before they are one? Is that a yes, a no, or a don't know? Okay, moving up. So this is before someone's trying you out, but it's when they're just asking around of people who really matter. So they're thinking they might buy that audit or do a trial, but before they do, they just check with someone else. Because considered buying decision aren't made in a vacuum. People, before people go to the trouble of, of undertaking a trial, which often takes a great deal of their time and sometimes there's a paid trial involved, they're going to consult other people. In a family, they might ask and want the tacit or, or explicit approval of their spouse, their children, their peer groups. People might turn to their friends, and I mean virtual friends or, you know, friends in the real world. And in businesses, people don't just consult other people, but they might actually have to get formal approval from colleagues or their boss or finance director or whatever it might be. And every time your potential buyer seeks the opinion of a third party, you risk losing the sale. So in this leak, the no critical approval, you need to ask yourself who can say no. And in the book, I go through finding new ways of reaching those third parties and equipping your buyer to be the salesperson for you. So here's the question, pen at the ready. Is there a clear way of educating or helping your buyer educate anyone who could veto the purchase decision? Is that a yes, a no, or a don't know? Moving on up. So now we're at the evaluation stage. This is when people are kind of sussing out your products and services against those of your competitors, usually. And here, this is about proof. So the leak is when you don't prove yourself. So assuming that at this stage you have someone's attention, it's this is when in the process the logical brain starts to kick in. This is when they're weighing your business, your products, your services up against, usually against two things. One is the promises you've made and the other is the specific list of buying criteria that they have. It's a process of evaluation and it's broadly logical. So what you need to do is make sure that for every promise you make, there's some proof. And in the book, I outline kind of two ways of proving yourself. The first is that there are other people who say that you're great. And the other is that there is some sort of evidence that shows that you're great. So let me ask you the question. Yes, no, don't know. Pen at the ready. Are you systematic about signposting some sort of proof against every promise or claim that you make? Yes, no, or don't know. Okay, we're moving up now and we're just in that stage where people are checking out the people, the businesses that they have on their list of um, people to consider for this purchase. You must have seen all the stats on the number of marketing messages people are exposed to every day. And I'm told it's somewhere around the 3,000 mark. People have so many things on their list. You know, important things like calling their dad and spending time with their family and eating and, you know, things that really matter in their lives. And, you know, they have to work out this buying decision. So if you just recognise that your buyers have really busy lives, you're going to quickly see that if you make it hard or time consuming for them to find out about you, while someone else has made it easy, 
then you're potentially going to lose someone at this stage. Now, I talk a lot in watertight marketing about earning the right to time. And I don't think for a moment that people don't give a considered purchase a lot of time. They do. <clears throat> but they don't give it all at once. And at this stage in the buying process, you need to just give them enough information to see whether they're interested or not. What I say in this is about having invitation information. And invitation information is something that broadly takes about the length of a cup of tea to digest. So here it is, here's the question. Do you have a steady stream of relevant information that invites people into finding out more? Yes, no, or don't know. Okay, so now we're getting on to the bit that most people probably think of as marketing. And this is all the, the piece about actually getting people to, to notice you in the first place. So leak number eight is that you're not representing your business for how they are looking. This is about format. Different people like different types of information. But more than that, different people may respond to the same information better when it's presented in a different way. You will have been told, no doubt, that video is increasingly popular. Um, and that's true kind of across the buyers, but definitely um, younger buyers. There aren't many chief execs I know who spend um, hours in front of YouTube. But, you know, someone down the line might when he asks a junior to do the research. So what you need to make sure is that you have information for everyone who's going to be um, doing the research at this stage. That might be someone in the kind of HR team, a junior who's been asked to do some research. They're going to look at some some um, videos on YouTube, maybe. The chief exec who goes on the train quite a lot has asked the PA to print out something he can read on the move. You know, these are the sorts of things you need to think about. So I, in the book, talk about making sure that you have the right format selection for your potential buyers. And there's a really useful tool in there that separates kind of six styles of format just to make sure you have a range and a mix. So let me ask you the question. Pens at the ready. Is there content available in a range of familiar and novel formats that people can engage with ease and enjoyment? Yes, no, or don't know. Moving on, leak number nine. Leak number nine is that you are not where they are looking. Let's assume for a moment that your information is excellent, it's in the right format. What you now need to know to do is get it in front of the right people because you know if you're not in the right place then people are just not going to know that you're there. You might assume that search engines are the natural starting point for, for buying journeys, but increasingly, you know, that's not necessarily true. Online, you might start an inquiry on YouTube, you might get into a conversation on Twitter, see a post on Facebook. Out in the real world, you might get chatting. Um, to a colleague or to a friend down the pub. There are so many ways that people actually start their buying journeys these days. And what you need to really work on is triangulation. There's there's something, you know, in, in scientific research, and it I don't know what the psychology of it, but it but it works. And that is that if you see the same thing from kind of three different angles, then it's on that third touch that you suddenly go, oh, right. I've noticed that. I get it. So what you're looking for in your marketing is this really powerful triangulation so that effectively you're everywhere they turn. So here's the question. Are there at least three places to put your materials that you know your potential buyers already access? That's yes, no or don't know. So, moving on, leak number 10. 
This is about timing. This is not representing your business, not there when they're looking. To gain a person's awareness, your company is going to need to come to mind, to hand, to eye, to ear, at the moment that the potential buyer is in the market for you, for what you're selling. You need to be there when their their ears prick up about the sort of thing that you do. And in the book, what I go through is what I call 3S timing. It's about understanding selective attention. It's about powerfully using seasonality, and there's seasonality in all businesses, and being smart about your scheduling. So let's ask you the question for leak number 10. Have you made a commitment to timing the release of your materials so that people are most likely to notice it? Have you researched this? Are you doing it the right time? Yes, no, or don't know. Okay, leak number 11. Leak number 11 is not being known by who your buyer asks. Now, we talked about format, we've talked about channels being in the right place. Now, what about the person they turn to? Because so many buying decisions actually start with people asking around. In the early stages of, of a purchase, people will actually cast their net quite wide. They might, you know, put a post on Facebook saying, anyone know of any decent lawnmower repairmen or whatever it might be. And the point is that in a, in a networked world, the sheer quantity of potential third party opinions is mind boggling. We've got official review sites, posting a question on Twitter, um, asking their friends for their opinion. So what you need to do is know who your buyers are likely to turn to when they're doing that initial research and find ways of making sure that your company just pops into their mind. Because here, you, what you need to think about is just getting your name known by the right sort of people. And nobody is nobody. There are two key ways in the book that really fix the leak of not being known by who they ask. And the first is mastering word of mouth. And there's a phrase I use and it runs through all of this and it's about commercial karma, making people feel warm and that they want to, to speak nicely about you. And the second is conversation starters. So actually saying something that is shareable, that people pass on, that sticks in their minds. So here it is. Here's the question. Leak number 11. Is there a way of getting people talking about your business so that buyers hear something good about you regardless of who they turn to? Yes, no, or don't know. Okay, we're moving on to leak number 12 now. And leak number 12 is probably the one that I find most painful when I see it in evidence. And this is when people know your company, but they don't actually know what you do. You know, they've kind of got you um, filed in their minds wrong. Um, one of my one of my clients, um, one of the, they had a, a request to close down services and transfer it to another business. And when they were asked, you know, why why were you doing this? Is when we first started working together, the client said, um, "Well, I didn't know that you offered that." <laughs> So they'd been buying a, a a small service from this business for a long time, but they didn't realise that they offered the full package. So when they wanted the full package, they went to somebody else, even though they were a client of this business. And that's because the when we started working together, the client in question was not setting those smaller products in the context of what the wider service and what they do. So you need to really take care in what you're talking about. You need to make sure that you're continually and really mindfully talking about the right kind of work for your business, the kind of work that you want. And I encourage you in the book to think about one key theme and then three messages to support it. And I also just prompt you to have a think about the name and the strap line of your business. Do people immediately know what you do and what the benefit of working with you would be? 
So here it is. Here's the question. Do you have an absolute clarity of purpose in telling people what your business does? Yes, no, or don't know. And now we get to the top of this sales funnel. And this is probably one that you've heard lots of marketeers go on about. And it's critically important. <clears throat> this is last on the list, by no means least in importance. And it's about getting your emotional messaging right up front. You absolutely need to grab someone's attention in order to get them to know who you are. The best way to do that is to have an emotional impact. Human beings are built to respond to particular stimuli and from a really early age we respond to emotional prompts instinctively. These are things like you know, smiles and danger. You cannot help but respond to an emotional stimulus. So for your business, if you can get someone to have an emotional reaction, they cannot help but notice you. So here is the question. Do you strike an emotional chord with your potential buyer? That means they cannot help but notice you and feel compelled to take action. So there it is. Those are the 13 touchpoint leaks. And you should now have your sheet of yes, no's and don't know's. And this is what I'd like you to do. I would like you to go through the don't know's first and just read that chapter two, which is free, available on the website. So you don't have to go buy the book to do this. Read chapter two on anything that you've put don't know against. And if it's don't know because you don't understand what the leak means, then you know, read the chapter. But if it's don't know because you don't know what you're going and doing in your business, go and find out. Now then, you should now be able to get to a red, orange, green, a traffic light report on this worksheet. So I want you to go through and just with a, either with coloured pens or maybe you put three asterisks, you know, three little stars for, um, for red, two for amber and, and tick for green. And I want you to go through each of those leaks and assess them. So here we go, you put your red spots on anything where you think you have a serious leak. You put amber where you think, yeah, okay, it could do with a little bit of tightening up. And then you put green against those where you think you've really got it nailed. And then you turn it into an action plan. On the on your worksheet, what you'll see is the, the references in the book of you know where you read and find out about what the, the fixes are that I've suggested. And for each of the fixes I've suggested, there's a case study, there's a fully worked example, and then when you register your copy of Watertight Marketing on the website, what you get is a powerful companion of, of um, a powerful pack of companion material. And it's a set of exercises like this one that I've gone through with you today that work, walk you through fixing that leak. And on your, um, on your uh, assessment sheet, there's a, a, a column there that says C and it's got the workbook reference for the exercise you need to fix that leak. But it's more powerful than that. You, you've now got an action plan in terms of what you need to do. But let me also show you that you have an order. The things you address first are anything on red from the bottom up. So on the one that I've just uh, put up on screen, this mocked up example, you would do um, forgotten customers, no critical approval, information overload and no emotional impact first. Then you go back to the bottom and you go up through the amber. So poor onboarding, no gateway, when, who, where. And then once you've done that, go to the things that you think you've got nailed and just see if you can make squeeze a bit more from it. And if you do things in this order, then it means that every step builds on the last and every ounce that you put into your marketing will pay back and build on the last. 
So that's your 13 touch point leaks. So now you have an action plan. You should now have in front of you an action plan about what you need to do to make sure that your marketing operation is giving you the very best return. What you're also going to find in watertight marketing is the watertight marketing framework. And this is so powerful. It's something that you know marketing teams that I work with put up on the wall in front of them and use to map their marketing plan. And this framework effectively means if you can get a tick in each of these boxes, you have a watertight marketing plan. It's a marketing plan on one sheet of paper. What you will also find is a chapter on budgeting and making sure that you have an affordable marketing plan that is responsive, that is flexible, and make sure that you have every job covered. I also talk about measurement and mindful measurement and making sure that what you measure and how you measure is improving and not degrading your marketing effort. When you register your book, as I said, you get access to the workbooks. There are four workbooks, there are 85 exercises and all. You're not going to need to do all of them, but you will definitely, amongst them, find the exercises that are going to be really powerful for your business. I've effectively taken my last 16 years of working with businesses and I have put down the, what I go through with them as an exercise and I really, I'm so, so excited to get this out there. When you register your copy of Watertype Marketing on the website, these all get emailed to you um, straight away and you can get on with it straight away. So there it is, Watertype Marketing. Go and grab part one um, from watertypemarketing.com and do please um, drop me a line. You can find me on Twitter at Bryony Thomas or at Watertight Marketing, or you can head on over to Facebook and um, you can chat with us there. I really hope that you've found that um, useful and I'm looking forward to finding out and hearing from you when you've tightened a few of those leaks and you're really seeing it take effect on your business. Thank you for your time.